Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She received her medical degree from uh, Lima, Peru, and then went on to complete a residency in internal medicine at UD Southwestern and a fellowship in endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Her two areas of interest are obesity and management of complex cholesterol disorders. And she's on the faculty of the lipid section for the ESA, which is sponsored by Endocrine Society. She's also been a co-investigator on lipid-related clinical trials and has been recognized as an educator by the William D. Salmon Teaching Award from the Division of Diabetes at Vanderbilt. Dr. Leon is going to talk about updates in the management of hypercholesteremia. Dr. Leon. Thank you, Dr. Mackin, and thank you for Kevin, me, for, Kevin for inviting me. Um, I assume that you are able to see my slides, so I'm just going to uh, keep going. So these are my financial disclosures. So uh, what I'm going to review today uh, for all of you is we're going to go specifically uh, re going to review the management of hypercholesterolemia. We're going to start by uh, remembering who are candidates for LDL lowering therapy. Most of my talk is going to be on the new medications that we have uh, currently available to lower LDL cholesterol. And at the end, I'm going to give you my perspective on how to put these new drugs into context uh, for our patient management. So I'm going to start uh, by presenting two patients that will come back uh, at the end of my talk. So the first patient is someone, uh, and both of them came to my lipid clinic. The first one is a male who uh, has a history of coronary artery disease. He is a status post coronary artery bypass graft surgery. He also has hypertension and hypothyroidism. He's taking several medications, but the one pertinent to me was uh, he was taking a torvastatin 80 milligrams every night. And uh, this is his current lipid panel. His total cholesterol is 179. His triglycerides are 130. His HDL is 39 and his LDL is 92. So the question uh, here is, is a high intensity statin enough or uh, should we add another medication? And if we think that another medication is necessary, then uh, what would you uh, recommend? The next patient now is a 54 year old female. She has a uh, rheumatoid arthritis and hypertension. And the reason she comes is uh, because of her family history. Her dad had a myocardial infarction when he was 54, and her brother also needed to have a percutaneous coronary intervention at the same age uh, because of coronary artery disease. She's a non-smoker, and her medications include a hydrochlorothiazide and a tandercept. You calculate her 10-year ASCVD risk, and that comes back at 5.2%. Her lipid panel, her total cholesterol is 274. Her triglycerides are 179. Her HDL is 50, and her LDL is 165. So here, the same questions. Do we need to start her on a medication? And if we decide to start her on a medication, what would be the best option for her? So let's start remembering who should we treat? Who are the groups of patients that we should be thinking on treating specifically for lowering their LDL cholesterol? And these recommendations actually were updated with the guidelines from a 2018 from a, the American Heart Association. Before the prior guidelines were in 2014 and the guidelines, the newer ones in 2018 made some changes that we're going uh, to review. So as you remember, there are four main groups of patients that are going to benefit from LDL lowering therapy. The first group are those patients who already had an event, those with clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So if you have a patient who already had a myocardial infarction, needed a PCI, had a stroke, these are patients who are going to benefit from being on LDL lowering therapy. What the new guidelines add is that now within this first group, 
they divide it in two subgroups, those who are at very high risk for having another event and those that are not at very high risk for another event. So who do they consider are at very high risk for another event? Are patients who have a history of multiple major ASCVD events. And there on the left, you have the list of a, what they consider major ASCVD events, either a history of MI or a history of a stroke. And if you have more than one, then you would be considered at very high risk. And who else is considered at very high risk? Either those who have one major ASCVD event with multiple high risk conditions. And once again, there on the table, you have the high risk conditions, and those are driven by a age older than 65, having familial hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, hypertension. So who is the second group? The second group of patients who are going to benefit from therapy are those that are considered to have severe hypercholesterolemia. And here, the cutoff for LDL is having consistently an LDL greater than 190. So if you have a patient who has an LDL consistently one, higher than 190, they would be considered to have severe hypercholesterolemia and treatment is indicated. The third group of patients that uh, we recommend treating are those that we see on our diabetes clinic. Patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes between the ages of 40 and 75, LDL lowering therapy is also recommended. And then the fourth group is also a new group in these uh, current guidelines, is the group where we're doing mainly primary prevention. So those are individuals between the ages of 40 and 75 who do not have diabetes, whose triglycerides are between 70 and 190, and what we uh, do for these patients is you calculate their 10-year ASCVD risk. You put their information, their age, their gender, their race, their blood pressure, their current cholesterol values, and that is going to give you a 10-year ASCVD risk. If your risk is less than 5%, you're considered to be at low risk. If your risk comes between 5% and 7.5%, you're considered to be at borderline risk. If your risk is between seven and a half and 20, you're considered to be at intermediate risk. And if your risk is greater than 20, you're considered to be at higher risk. So this is something new uh, provided by uh, the recent uh, guidelines. So we just reviewed who do we have to treat. Now the next question is, we know who we have to treat how can we treat them? What are the tools we have to treat hypercholesterolemia? So first, as it was discussed in, in, in the, in the, with the prior group, with the prior panel, in the setting of elevated LDL, diet is also important. We saw the role of diet for high triglycerides. Diet is also important when we manage hypercholesterolemia. And once again, the focus is going to be fat we need to ask our patients who have a hypercholesterolemia to limit their fat intake. And there uh, on this slide, I give you some recommendations on what would be the highest amount of fat uh, they, it would be recommended for uh, this specific group. Something else would be exercise, and of course, a smoking cessation is going to be key for this group of patients. And if we go to medications, pharmacotherapy, what do we have that we have had now for some time, and I'm sure most of our are familiar prescribing? Always, when you manage a patient with a hypercholesterolemia, your first line of treatment are going to be statins. So as you know, we have different statins, they have different doses, and depending on which statin we use and what dose we use, LDR lowering is going to vary. We have two statins that are considered high intensity statins. There they are, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. And as you remember, the way statins work is by blocking cholesterol production at the level of HMJ QA reductase. So statins are always going to be a, our first choice in therapy for these patients. 
what else do we have available? We have a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. In this class of medications, we only have one uh, drug that is acetimibe. It comes on one dose, 10 milligram daily. And the way a cholesterol absorption inhibitors work is by blocking the Neiman peak receptor. So therefore, cholesterol cannot uh, enter the uh, lumen, luminal cells. How much does acetimibe lower LDL cholesterol? It depends. If you take it as monotherapy, you would expect an 18% reduction in LDL cholesterol. However, when a patient is taking acetimibe and statin, we can have a reduction of LDL cholesterol of about 25%. And the other class of drugs that has been around also a long time are bile acid sequestrants. So I have listed there uh, the bile acid sequestrants we have available. Uh, what doses are the ones that we recommend and how much they lower LDL cholesterol. And as you can see, these varies uh, from medication to medication. And just a quick reminder of the way bile acid sequestrants lower cholesterol. Um, bile acid sequestrants decrease the um, bile acid pool. And by doing this, more cholesterol is going to be used to replace these bile acids. And that's how they uh, lower LDL cholesterol. So if we have to summarize what we have available and we have had available for years, these are kind of the three uh, drug groups that we have available. Statins that can lower LDL cholesterol depending which one you use and at the dose, somewhere between 18 to 60 percent. Uh, we have one cholesterol absorption inhibitor that can lower LDL somewhere between 18 to 25 percent. And uh, we have bile acid sequestrants that once again, depending on which one you use, you're going to have an LDL lowering of 15 to 30%. So then, what is new? And in the last six years, we have had approval of three uh, new uh, medications, uh, specifically uh, to lower LDL cholesterol. So I'm going to start uh, with the PCSK9 inhibitors and the way they work. So as you remember, the LDL particle that you have here binds to the LDL receptor. This complex goes into the hepatocyte and the signal in the hepatocyte is to process the cholesterol and to recycle the LDL receptor back to the surface of the hepatocyte. So this is uh, what happens. However, when you have PCSK9, this protein that is made in the liver, bind this complex, bind the LDL particle and the LDL receptor complex, the signal the liver gets this time is, let's go ahead and process the cholesterol. However, the LDL receptor is also destroyed. So we don't have an LDL receptor that is going to go back to the surface of the hepatocyte to help us with um, binding to LDL. So how do these medications work? These uh, PCSK9 inhibitors are monoclonal antibodies. So what they do is they bind to the PCSK9 protein, therefore this protein cannot bind to the LDL particle LDL receptor complex, and there is no signal for the LDL receptor to be destroyed. On the contrary, it can go back to the surface of the hepatocyte to uh, join another LDL particle. So this is a summary of uh, the phase three trials. There are, uh, these were done on, with two uh, different medications. And they were done uh, both with patients who have coronary artery disease and their LDL cholesterol was not at goal, or they were done with patients with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And what you can see is that the results for both medications with similar populations are, are similar. They lower LDL cholesterol somewhere between 45 to 60%. And after those studies, uh, we got results in 2017 of their outcome 
trials. For all of these medications, outcomes are very important, and they both uh, had the results. And I'm only going to present the results for ivolocumab because uh, they are very similar. So here on this study, they enrolled over 27,000 patients who already had an event, whose LDL was greater than 70, and who were on a maximally tolerated statin dose. And they were followed for a little bit over two years. And what did they found? They found that the addition of evolocumab decreased their uh, endpoint that was having another uh, ASCVD event. So there you can see the red line is the evolocumab group, the blue line is the placebo group, and there were less events for the group that received uh, evolocumab. So in 2015, around July or August of 2015, the FDA approved these medications to be used in addition to diet and very important, maximally tolerated studying therapy. And they approved this medication to be used specifically on two groups of patients. They approved it on patients who uh, have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or in patients who had clinical ASCVD who require additional lowering of LDL cholesterol. So as I mentioned before, uh, we have two drugs available. Alirocumab comes in two doses, 75 milligrams and 150 milligrams. You can give uh, these medications every two weeks and evolucumab comes only on one dose of 100 milligrams. Both medications can be given once a month, and specifically for evolucumab, the, it comes also on a little pump device called Pushtronic that the patient can place uh, on their abdomen or on the leg, and over nine minutes, it's going to deliver the medication. So that is a good option if your patient has any fear about needles, uh, just doing the injectable once a month may be a better option. So once you start a patient on a PCSK9 inhibitor, what I recommend is that you check their lipid panel maybe after two months of therapy to determine if in the case of alirucumab, you need to increase the dose or not. Side effects. What do you need to tell your patients about side effects? It's mainly three. The first one are injection side reactions, where they do the injection. The second one and the one that I see most commonly in practice are flu-like symptoms. So every time they get their injection, they may have a runny nose or some muscle pain for two days, mostly three, and then those symptoms go away. However, the next time they do their injection, those symptoms are going to recur. And the last side effect I tell them about is a back pain. So now we can add uh, PCSK9 inhibitors to our table. So um, once again, in average, they uh, provide a reduction of LDL of 40 to 60 percent. Now we move on to another new drug, and this one is a uh, benpedoic acid. Benpedoic acid was approved by the FDA last year, and this is a prodrug. This prodrug needs to be activated at the liver, and it's activated by the liver by the very long chain, acyl-CoA synthetase 1. And this enzyme is only present at the liver. And as you can see here on this illustration, the active form of benpedoic acid inhibits ATP citrate lyase, ACL. And by doing this, it's going to decrease acetyl coenzyme A, which eventually is going to lower the production of cholesterol, which is going to increase the number of LDL receptors in the liver. So benpedoic acid also works in the path of cholesterol synthesis, but it's at a different level than uh, statins, where statins work. So what did the phase two study show? What did it show in regards to LDL reduction? So when patients received uh, benpedoic acid alone, 
it lowered LDL cholesterol by about 27%. When benpedoic acid was given in addition to a statin, benpedoic acid provided a 24% additional LDL reduction, and when it was added to acetimibe, it provided an additional 25% reduction in LDL cholesterol. But how about safety? And uh, this is a phase three study where they enrolled patients who either already had an uh, ASCVD event or had heterozygous FH or both who had a, an LDL cholesterol greater than 70. And they were on maximally tolerated statin therapy. And these patients received either benpedoic acid or placebo and the primary endpoint for this study was safety, but they also looked at a change in LDL cholesterol. So what did they find? There you can see the participants. Their mean age was about 66 years old. Most were men and white. And at baseline, their LDL cholesterol was 103. So what did this study show in regards to LDL reduction? By week 12, they had an LDL reduction of about 17%. When looking at adverse events, there was no difference in the number of adverse events between the benpedoic acid group and the placebo group. And there was also no difference in the number of serious adverse events. However, the group that, that received benpedoic acid had more adverse events that lead to discontinuation of the drug. And also very important, the incidence of gout was higher in the benpedoic acid group compared to the placebo group. The outcomes trial for uh, this drug, the clear outcomes is currently ongoing. Um, and we expect the results of this trial by uh, March of next year. Their primary outcome, as you can see, is time from randomization to first ASCVD event, and the patients that they are they, that they have enrolled, or either already have or are at high risk for a cardiovascular disease. So this uh, result should be coming uh, next year. So last year, uh, the FDA granted approval to benpedoic acid. And once again, the approval for this drug or the group that it has been targeted is the same as the one for uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors. So it's once again an add-on drug that can be used on patients who are taking maximally tolerated statin, either with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia or with clinical ASCVD whose um, LDL cholesterol is not at all. So this comes on a tablet that a patient has to take once a day. It can be given uh, with or without food. And here in the United States, we have uh, two presentations. You can get benpedoic acid by itself. Uh, it's a 180 milligram tablet, or you can get a fixed combination with a cetimibe. That is going to be 180 milligrams of benpedoic acid and uh, 10 milligrams uh, of acetimibe. Most frequent side effects, what do you have to tell your patient if you put them on benpedoic acid? The first one is that it can raise uric acid, which uh, could lead to gout. So that's something that we'll talk uh, in more detail later. There is also a risk of upper respiratory tract infections and uh, thrombocytopenia. Something else you need to tell your patients that it's rare, but tendon rupture has been reported. And if your patient is already taking simvastatin or lovastatin and you decide to uh, add a benpedoic acid, there I have listed what are the highest doses they can be of uh, these medications. So what happens uh, with uric acid? So the study showed that uh, patients who took benpedoic acid had higher levels of uric acid and also higher number of gout flares compared with placebo. 
Something else that it's important is that this increase of uric acid is seen in the first week, four weeks of therapy. So if the patients are going to have an increase in uric acid, it's going to be on these first four weeks. And the main risk factor for this to happen is to have a history of gout. So the reason this happens is because benpedoic acid and uric acid, they both compete for the same renal transporter involved in the excretion of these compounds. So what should you tell your patients? If they have gout, I would recommend that uh, you check their uric acid at baseline and maybe at week four to make sure that uh, if to assess if it's uh, rising or not. And even in those patients who do not have gout, what I do in practice is I check their uric acid before I start therapy. And for those who do not have gout, I ask them to monitor for symptoms, for new symptoms of gout. And usually I check their uh, uric acid level again when they come for their follow-up visit somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks to see if there was a change in uric acid. And the other important consideration is tendon rupture. So once again, the phase three studies showed that that happened more frequently on the treatment group, on the benpedoic acid group. And the most common affected tendons are the biceps and the rotator cuff. And different to uric acid that we see the increase in the first four weeks, this tendon rupture really, uh, there was not a specific time frame when it happened. And you can see there are risk factors. Who are patients that are uh, at higher risk for this happening are those who are uh, older than 60, who are taking for quinolones, who uh, receive intraarticular st steroids, or who have a prior history of rotator cuff syndrome. So once again, when you counsel your patients about starting them on this medication, you need to mention this, and just to let you know if they're having any joint pain uh, or swelling. So once again, back to the table, um, this is another drug that we have now available to lower LDL cholesterol, and it adds an, an about 16% uh, reduction uh, on this. And the last medication I'm going to talk about, this is the last agent that was uh, recently approved for LDL cholesterol lowering, is evinacumab. So evinacumab is another monoclonal antibody, and in this case, it specifically binds to angiopotein-like protein 3. So angiopotein-like protein 3 is a protein that is only expressed in the liver, and the main role of this protein is to inhibit lipoprotein lipase and endothelial lipase. So if you inhibit this, you're going to inhibit the hydrolysis of triglycerides, in triglyceride-rich protein, rich lipoproteins, which is going to lead to higher triglycerides and uh, to higher LDL. There are patients who uh, have loss of function variants of angiopotein like protein 3, and these patients have been shown to have lower LDL levels, lower triglycerides, and also lower risk of coronary artery disease. So how does evinacumab work? Once again, this is a monoclonal antibody that is going to bind to angiopoietin-like protein 3. And by binding to this protein, now lipoprotein lipase can act normally. And if that happens, this is going to lower triglycerides, which is going to lower VLDL, it's going to lower IDL, and eventually it's going to lower LDL as well. Another important point about this drug and its mechanism of action is that it works independently from the LDL receptor. The other medications that we just discussed, they depend on the LDL receptor to be more effective with LDL clearance. However, this medication works in an independent way in regards to the LDL receptor. So the LIPS trial it was a double-blind, placebo-controlled phase three trial that enrolled only patients who had a homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, who were a 12 years of age or older, who had an LDL cholesterol greater than 70. And here patients either received evinacumab every four weeks or placebo. And the primary endpoint for this study was 
change from baseline in LDL cholesterol. So what did they find? At baseline, these patients had an LDL cholesterol of 255, and 82% had a genetically confirmed diagnosis of homozygous FH. It's important to mention that more than 50% were taking at least three other lowering agents, lipid lowering agents, to get uh, their DL control. So what did this study show? That the group that received evinacumab had an LDL reduction of about 47%. So earlier this year, the FDA approved evinacumab as an adult agent for patients who are 12 years of age of older with a homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. This uh, medication is given as an IV infusion and there uh, you have the dosing, 15 milligrams per kilo, and it's approved to be given uh, every four weeks. How about side effects? Uh, the most common side effects are uh, infusion, side, infusion reactions. And unlike other monoclonal antibodies, uh, nasopharyngitis, uh, flu-like symptoms, dizziness, and uh, nausea. So we are going to see, you're going to see more uh, results of studies using this medication as now they are targeting a different population. And so far, uh, we have this phase two study and here, patients that participated either had a heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and a ASCVD disease, and their LDL was greater than 70, or a, they had an LDL greater than 100 for those patients without ASCVD disease. Um, and here, what they studied is um, giving this medication both in a subcutaneous way or a, a still IV that is the way that is currently approved. And the primary endpoint for this study was a change from baseline in a LDL cholesterol. So I'm going to show you the results. Uh, first, the ones for a, when the medication was administered, administered in, in a subcutaneous way. So as you can see, uh, the dose was 450 every week. They try different doses, 300 milligrams every week or 300 milligrams every two weeks. Uh, the mean age of the participants was 50. And interestingly, most of patients were female uh, uh, and also most white and about 72% had heterozygous FH. In this study, all of the patients already needed to be on a PCSK9 inhibitor and in some form of a statin. And you can see with that, their baseline line LDL was 150. And then depending on which dose they received and the frequency, the reduction on LDL was different. With the group with a higher LDL reduction was those who received 450 milligrams every week. Then they also had a group that received the IV infusion of the medication at the current approved dose that is 15 milligrams per kilo every four weeks. And they also used a lower dose of five milligrams per kilo also every four weeks. The patients that were included were similar and uh, their baseline LDL here was 145. And once again, the LDL reduction of about 50%, which is similar to what was seen in the uh, study with uh, patients with homozygous FH. So now we can add evinacumab as another a uh, pharmacologic option for a uh, LDL reduction. So now after reviewing all of this, the question is how do you put this in your clinical practice? How do you help your patients choose what is the best agent for them? And here um, I'm going to give you uh, my perspective of things you need to think about. The first important consideration is if you're doing primary prevention or a secondary prevention. I think depending on which group your patient is, your treatment options are going to be different. The second important point is cost. And like I'm sure I do here in Nashville, 
uh, getting some of these medications approved by insurance can be a big challenge. So here I have included the costs of uh, these new medications, their monthly cost, if uh, this was not covered by insurance. So if you can see uh, for benpedoic acid, we're talking about $420. Uh, for the PCSK9 inhibitors, somewhere between five to 600. Uh, for evinacumab, I have only included the cost of the medication. I have not included the cost of the infusion process. As you can imagine, there is going to be a cost of using the facilities and uh, doing the infusion. And just as a reference, I also included the cost of acetimibe. That is a medication that has been around for a longer time. So if we start with evinacumab, if you're thinking that your patient may need evinacumab, as I just showed you, this is only approved for patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So if you think your patient has homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and uh, you want uh, to prescribe an evinacumab, uh, my recommendation would be that uh, you refer your patient to a lipid clinic who are familiar with uh, how getting approval for this uh, special infusion. Then, and once again, this is a, my, my recommendation of what I would do. If you have a patient that you uh, are doing secondary prevention, it's a patient who already had an event, or it's a patient who has severe hypercholesterolemia. Here would be your patients with heterozygous hypercholesterolemia. How should you approach their management uh, given these new medications? always start by uh, reminding the patients that they need to do a low-fat diet. After that, my recommendation is that you maximize statin therapy. This can be um, asking them to take even a small dose of atorvastatin or pravastatin, because when these medications were approved, they were approved to be used in addition to the maximal dose tolerated of statin. If that doesn't bring your patient's LDL to goal, then I would recommend adding acetimibe. And if despite being on combination with the statin and acetimibe, your patient's LDL is not at goal, then is when you get to decide if a PCSK9 inhibitor or a benpedoic acid is a better option. And this is when you discuss with the patient, and I think patient preference, administration preference, given that one is a pill, the other one is an injectable a medication burden, taking a pill every day versus an injection every two weeks. And of course, cost should come to the discussion. Then how about those patients that you see on their diabetes clinic with type one or type two that you're doing primary prevention? What should be your algorithm to help with their LDL lowering? Once again, you start with asking them to follow a low fat diet, as we did with the other group, maximize their statin therapy. And if despite being on a maximal statin dose, their LDL is not at goal, then your next step after that should be a setimibe. And if you are still not where you want to be adding a bilacid sequestrant, could be a good option. And finally, uh, for those patients that were doing primary prevention, those patients that we have calculated their risk, what should they be treated with? So if we have a patient who is at low risk of an ASCVD event, and those are patients whose risk is less than 5%, the recommendation is to ask them to work on lifestyle. For patients who have a borderline risk, these are patients whose risk comes between 5% and 7.5%. What you have to do for these patients is look for risk enhancers. Do they have anything else in their history, in their laboratory findings that would make them a higher uh, risk person? If you find risk enhancers, then the recommendation would be to start a moderate intensity statin. And here on this slide, I have included some of the risk enhancers like family history of premature heart disease and LDL greater than 160, having metabolic syndrome. So if you find one or most of these risk enhancers, then the recommendation would be to start the patient on a study. 
for those patients who are at intermediate risk, and that means the risk is between seven and a half and 20%, once again, look, look for risk enhancers, and if you find them, start a moderate intensity statin. However, if the patient is still not sure if they want to start a statin or not, uh, these new guidelines recommend ordering a calcium score. And then depending on the result of that test, if the calcium score is zero, then uh, don't, they don't need a statin. And then anything after that, uh, you will need to discuss with the patient if uh, they would like to start a statin or not. In this group of patients, if you need further LDL lowering after the statin, once again, adding a cetimibe or a bilacid sequestrant uh, could be an option. And then uh, the last group also for primary prevention, if you calculate the risk and the risk is more than 20%, starting at high intensity statin is what we would recommend. And if further lowering is needed for their LDL, once again, acetimibe or bilacid sequestrants eh, are an option. So going back to the cases I started with, you have this male who has coronary artery disease, which means we are doing secondary prevention. He's taking a torvastatin 80 milligrams at night. However, their LDL is 92, and we would like to lower his LDL further. So what would I prescribe first? I would recommend adding a cetimibe, checking his LDL cholesterol in uh, 9 to 12 weeks, and depending on that result, if further LDL is lower is needed, you can discuss uh, either benpedoic acid or a PCSK9 inhibitor. And then uh, for the first patient, the second patient I mentioned, this is a lady who were doing primary prevention. You calculate her 10-year risk and it's 5.2%. However, she has several risk enhancers. She has a family history of premature heart disease. She has an inflammatory condition with the rheumatoid arthritis and her LDL is greater than 160. So I would say, let's go ahead, ahead and start the statin. If she has problems with the statin, she cannot take them. Then uh, her next option could be either a cetimibe or a, a bilacid sequestrant. So with that, I am going to uh, finish my talk. And I think there are some questions uh, on the chat. I saw them coming. So I don't know, uh, Dr. Mackin, if you want me to read the questions or. Uh, why don't I go ahead and read the questions? But I wanted to thank you first. That is an excellent presentation. And I think all our people who are giving the boards will really benefit with this, whether it's the endocrine boards or the obesity boards. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. So Dr. Kashyap asked that AHA published new LDL guidelines for secondary prevention, targeting LDL of 55 and even 40 for high-risk individuals. What do you target in practice? That's a great question. So I'm a big believer that lower is better. So if I have an individual with a, any individual that comes for secondary prevention, less than 70 for the LDL, it's going to be for sure. And those individuals who continue having events despite being less than 70, then I'm going to be more aggressive and try to lower the LDL less than 50. My limit for lowering LDL is 25. So if I have someone whose LDL is lower than 25, two consecutive times, and this 25 is obtained by a direct LDL, that is usually when I start de-escalating therapy. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second one, and I think I had this question as well, is can you address the statin intolerant patient? So a version of this is a patient I got recently sent by the primary care physician who is who has a patient who didn't tolerate a statin, and we all know that this tolerance is a little bit iffy. Sometimes it shows up as the patient had an allergic reaction, which on talking to the patient doesn't seem to be the case. But the data you showed was that all these medications, the PCSK9 inhibitors, were tried on top of a statin. So one, is it easy to get approved if the patient does not tolerate a statin? So... The approval for the PCSK9 inhibitors, I think, is more based on the groups that ha it has been approved for. So if your patient has ASCVD 
or has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, those uh, groups of patients, the PCSK9 inhibitor should be approved because for some of them, the maximally tolerated dose of statin may be zero. The struggle is on patients who do not have ASCBD, who do not have heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and have challenges taking the statin. For those patients, um, I don't think it's really very insurance dependent. You may be uh, lucky and get it approved, but for these patients, it, it's just more challenging to get it approved. So uh, on those patients who have a statin intolerance that I think we all see in our clinic uh, frequently, usually uh, that is where the discussion comes. And if a patient who uh, has had problems with two statins come to my clinic, I'm going to do everything that I can to make them try as many statins as the patient is open to. And sometimes I have had patients try four or five statins, and that is when you take it maybe once a week, three times a week, a very small dose. For example, if rosuvastatin comes as a five milligrams, okay, take half of that tablet. There is really no evidence on uh, doing this. I don't think they're going to be studied. However, I think a smaller dose of statin is, is better than none. And if despite trying to do all of these uh, combinations, your patient cannot take a statin, then I would say moving to a cetimibe could be a good option. All of these medications that I presented have done studies with patients with a history of statin intolerance. The problem is getting the FDA to give them approval for this specific patient population. All right, that's helpful to know. So if the patient is statin intolerant and truly statin intolerant after trying a few different kinds and a few different doses, then you move on to evitamide. Then yes. after that, would you try a bilastic sequestrant? I usually do. And the reason for that has to do with number one, a pill burden. If you want to do a bilastic sequestrant, even if you use cholesterol, you need to start with two of these tablets that are very large. A setting might be only a pill a day. And also bilacid sequestrants uh, give patients more side effects, mainly constipation. And uh, the timing of the bilacid sequestrant can also be an issue because it can also bind to other medications. You have to tell them to take it apart. So that is another thing that the patient has to do, take the pills in the morning and make the bilacid sequestrant at night. So it just makes it harder for patients to take. Um, and an important comment as well is that bilacid sequestrants also raise triglycerides. So usually my cutoff for triglycerides is 300. So if my patient's triglycerides are greater than 300, I don't start a bilacid sequestrant. Okay, thank you. That's a very practical tip. Um, Dr. Feynman asks, and Dr. Feynman, I do have to say you're probably asking for yourself, <laughs> what do you suggest for the elderly regarding continuation of current regimen and slash or initiating therapy? I think that is a great question, and actually it was addressed uh, on the guidelines. And I can share with you uh, what the guidelines say, and, and I think you can see the slide there. Yes. And the guidelines specifically address patients who are older than 75, whose LDL is 70 to 189. And, and once again, these are patients that were doing primary prevention, patients who have never had an effect. So the question is, what should we do? And as you can see there, it says initiating a statin may be reasonable. However, stopping may also be reasonable depending on the patient's uh, condition. So I think uh, it's going to be driven by patient preference. And I expect that uh, in the next years, the guidelines are, are, are going to need to increase the limit for age because all of our patients are living to 90 to 100. So um, I think that's going to change. But as of today, it's a, really a discussion with your patient of what they want to do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, Dr. Palonka Santos. Do you have risk enhancers for diabetes mellitus less than 40 years of age? So yes, so that's another good question uh, that was also uh, addressed on the guidelines. And once again, this is just came up on the new guidelines, which um, it's good to help us uh, have a perspective. So the question is, what do we do with our patients who are younger than 40 that we all have in clinic? What should we do uh, in regards to their cholesterol management? And the recommendation there is if your patient has uh, is between the ages of 20 and 39 
and they either have had diabetes for more than 10 years, and this is for type 2, or a, have had diabetes for more than 20 years if they have type 1, and they have a complication, a, a starting a statin, a, maybe a reasonable choice. All right, that's good to know. A uh, couple of comments from Dr. Mari Vargas and Dr. Pantlo not about how awesome your presentation was, which I completely agree with, and I think a lot of our audience did. Uh, we did have some of our internal medicine and family medicine colleagues actually join as well for this presentation. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Feel free to raise hands. We're going to wait a minute or so. Um, for that, I have to say, Dr. Leon, I have enjoyed listening to the outdoor sounds as well behind you. Uh, I presume with two young children, the quietest part of your house is outside the house. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, anybody else, any questions, comments? All right. Um, if we have nothing else to add, I would like to thank Dr. Leon again. Thank you so much. This is absolutely wonderful, both live as well as the fact that when we see it on our YouTube channel, people will be able to kind of refresh their memory, use it clinically, as well as use it for the boards. Um, and I will also like to remind our audience that our next EMI live session is going to be November 17th. We have Dr. Stephen Grinspoon coming from Harvard. He's professor of medicine and is going to be talking about HIV-related endocrine disorders. And with that, I'm going to finish our session for today. Thank you, Dr. Leon, again, um, and have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you for everybody. It was really good. Thanks. Thanks.